<clears throat> hey guys, how you yeah. doing? Sorry about that. No, if I fall, there's so many spirit. You guys with me? All right. Make sure you're prayed up. Guys, make sure you're prayed up. You've prayed and asked the Holy Spirit to fill every one of us. Ask the Holy Spirit to sanctify us. Ask the Holy Spirit to purify us, cleanse us in the blood of Jesus Christ. Yahweh, Father, Holy Spirit. We love you, Father. We fail you, but Lord, our desire is to love you. Father, have mercy on us. And please, Father, save us from our flesh. Save us from our sinful passions. Save us from the fruit of the flesh, the fruits of the flesh. By the power of the holy blood of our God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Cleanse us in the blood of Jesus, the Lamb. Purify us in the blood of Jesus Christ, the Lamb. Cleanse us in the blood of Jesus Christ, your Son. And by the power of the holy blood of Jesus, give us victory over the flesh. To conquer the flesh. To crucify the flesh. To resist the devil. And submit to you so he can flee. By the power of the Holy Spirit. Sanctify us by your Spirit. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. Fill us with fruit from your Holy Spirit. Fill us with love from your Holy Spirit. Life from your Holy Spirit. Passion from your Holy Spirit. Purity and holiness from your glorious Holy Spirit. <clears throat> and fill us with the breath of life. Life from your Holy Spirit, Father. Wash us in the blood of my God and save the Lord Jesus Christ. Wash us. Purify us, Father. For the sake of the Lord Jesus, forgive us and give us victory to be holy servants, holy children, pure and righteous and enslaved to you. In love with you, Father. In love with our God and Savior, Lord Jesus Christ. In love with your Holy Spirit and empowered by your Spirit to live a disciplined, holy Christian life. Intense spiritual discipline and physical discipline, Father. We love you. We love you. Lord Jesus, our God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, we love you, Son of God. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, take over. Fill my throat and my lungs and chest with life and anoint the sound of my voice to be pleasing to the ears of your servants. Holy Spirit, perfect my ability. Recall these facts and scriptures and interpret them correctly with wisdom and knowledge from your glorious, majestic, holy, beautiful presence. And just <clears throat> flood us in your presence, everyone here, Holy Spirit. Illuminate them. Destroy attacks of Satan, distractions of Satan. Keep the children of Satan away from us and constrain us and give us the power to exercise perfect self-control and constraint to be in control of our passions by your power, Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Cleanse my throat in the blood of Jesus. Strengthen it to use it to glorify Jesus and give us the grace to never disappoint Jesus or shame the Lord Jesus or or insult the Lord Jesus and Holy Spirit, be with our loved ones, be with my daughter, sanctify them and seal them in the love of the Father and wash them the blood of Jesus Christ and take over this session and bless this session. Lord. Blessed Holy Spirit, you are our Lord and bless the connection. We trust in you, we depend on you, we love you and we cling to you, Holy Spirit. You are the eternal spirit of the Father and of the Son, our God and Savior, Lord Jesus Christ. We love you, Yahovah Rapha. Heal us, Yahovah Rapha. Heal us, Yahovah Rapha. Father, Holy Spirit, heal us spiritually, emotionally, <clears throat> mentally, and physically. In Jesus' name we pray, Yahovah, Father, Son, Spirit, watch me, my God, my Savior, King, Lord Jesus Christ. Invite people. I have a Christian brother who has questions about Islam that he wants me to help him. We may be in for a triple header today. There's a young Christian man who has a Muslim friend that wants to call me. So I may do another session, and there's this rabid anti-Trinitarian, another nobody, another tool of the devil, a son of Satan, who is basically a nobody. He just started a YouTube channel trying to make a name at our expense. I've called him out to call me. I'm going to give you his website and email to challenge him to call me on Skype and defend his false satanic doctrine so we can destroy his lies by the power of the triune God for the glory of Jesus Christ. I'll give you his name in a minute. He just started a YouTube channel and trying to make a name at our expense. I'll send him packing him and his false God by the power of the true God, the Lord Jesus, who's the eternal son, right? I think he's a modalist, heretic, Michael. But with that said, pray up. Please do me a favor. Pray in your hearts. Ask Holy Spirit to give us the grace to focus, to destroy distractions, and do not let Satan win. Rebuke him in the name of Jesus as we're covered by the blood of Jesus. Pray. So I'm going to call this young man right now. <clears throat> so let's begin. He's a Christian, asks questions. Let's see. He wants to reach Muslims. Let's see. He 
Yes, sir. What's up? What's up, buddy? Go ahead. Okay, you can sound test. Sound, sound test. How's your sound? Go ahead, talk. So we can hear you. Do you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, friend. What's going on? That's great. So how are you? By the grace of God. How are you? Very good, man. Thank you. By the grace of God, too. Amen. What did you so, say? Yeah. You, what are the questions? You said Muslims. They have questions for you? Yeah, I was an Italian Muslim in my gym. Oh. And uh, Friday, I tried to preach the gospel and everything. Knowing, I even watched your videos with uh, Al Fadi and David Wood and everything, but I still couldn't, like, I was in, like, focus and I couldn't answer his questions. You got too much noise in the background, buddy. Too much noise in the background. All right. Much better? Okay. Yeah. So I got the questions. These are the questions that he asked me to go home and, you know, to look it up for yourself and say, that's, you know, uh, he also said that we are not following Jesus, but we're following Paul. Yeah. So I get to so okay, I got some questions. Sure. Uh, how do I explain Matthew fifteen twenty four? Brother, here's what I'm gonna say out of love for you, because remember, I I want to mm -hmm. serve you, and I want to be used of the Holy Spirit to perfect you. The fact that you asked me the question, you haven't been following me, and you don't listen to my sessions. Okay. You know why, right? Yeah, I know. Why? Because I just answered Matthew 15, 24 last week, and I got articles on it. So let okay. me ask you, and this again, brother, We it says, you know, <clears throat> uh, better is open your rebuke than hidden love, right? Do you have your Bible with you? Do you have your Bible? Yeah, I have a Bible. Okay, open up. Read for me Proverbs 27. Yeah, right Read Proverbs 27, 4 to 5. As the Holy Spirit enables me to call these passages for his glory in Jesus' name. Be, be yes, if you can't have your Bible. As I told you, have your Bible ready because we can't do a discussion. We have, you know, have your Bible. So just open up Proverbs 27, 4 to 5. Proverbs 27. Verses 4 and 5, yes. Okay. Verses four and five. Can you repeat the verses? Sorry, it's twenty-seven. Uh, um, the four verses five. are verses four and five. Four and five. Okay. Wrath mm -hmm. is cruel and anger is out outrageous. But who is able to stand before envy? Open rebuke is better than secret love. So. Okay. Okay, now go to Psalm 141 and verse 5. Psalm 141, verse 5. Psalm 145. A lot of noise in the background. Okay, Psalm 45, verse... Psalm 141, verse 5. 141. Brother, you need time to organize better because it's like chaos, too much noise, and you're not listening clearly. Do you need time to organize and call me back? Oh, no, it's cool. It's cool. Okay. Okay. Psalm 141, verse 5. Okay. Let the righteous smite me, smite me, it shall be kindness. Let him reprove me, it shall be an excellent oil. Mm -hmm. It shall not break my head, for yet my prayer also shall be in their uh, candle. Uh, okay. I'm trying to do this in love for the sake of the Lord, uh, but the fact that you told me you could answer Matthew 15, 24, and you said you've been following Al Fadi and me, brother, I either you're lying or you didn't. Video, but, like, some, yeah. Say it again. No, I didn't watch like every like video, but like, some videos. And when's the last time you watched my sessions? Uh, I watched some of uh, the Unitarian one, hmm. the one with the Muslim who asked you questions, like the one who properly asked you questions. Okay. Yeah, yeah that, one, that was the last okay. one, I believe. Yeah, so if you're not intentionally, purposefully studying to mm -hmm. know your faith and understand and live it out so you can then also explain it, these questions are going to are going to be troublesome. So I'm very disappointed that Matthew 15, 24 came up and you didn't address it. Are you going to be able to see him again and address it? 
Uh, yeah, I go to the gym Friday. He even told me I can like FaceTime him and explain it to him. So why does he FaceTime me and call me on Skype and say, my friend will answer your questions? But that was Matthew fifteen twenty four. What else did he bring up so I can get an understanding of what passages he brought up? Isaiah 42, Matt, uh, John 17, and 1 John 4, 9. So, yeah. Also, yeah, why would he Jesus bring, came one, why would he bring up 1 John 4, 9? Sorry? Why did he bring up 1 John 4, 9? 1 John chapter just, 4, verse 9. I asked him, like, give me just give me some verses that you don't think it's right, and that's I wrote them down. That's why I came here to ask you. Yeah, but why did he give you 1 John 4, verse 9? First John, four, four nine. nine. That's what I said. But why? Uh, so he just gave you. You don't know why he gave you verses, brother? Uh, no. Okay. No. So then, how do you know how to answer his questions if you don't know what his questions are? That's true. I just, I just, you know, like asked you, and you give me the Skype. So I was like, I might as well like learn on the spot. So yeah. But how are you gonna help him if you don't know what his questions are? True. That's true. You're right. You're telling me now I'm right. That's true. You didn't mm -hmm. prepare yes. this. I have to tell you this. Uh, yes. is, is your friend it's available? Maybe he can call me because I don't know why he's quoting First John four verse nine to you when it talks about Jesus Christ being the only begotten Son. What was he trying to accomplish? All right, that's true. Do you? Uh... Want me to like FaceTime him or you want me to send it your yeah. Skype to him? Do you want to FaceTime him and say my friend is live and you just want to call me Skype or does he want to just listen in and I can answer him? Go ahead because here you're writing down. See, here's where I'm very baffled and confused. And I say this, my brother, again, I'm trying to benefit you and others so they can learn. But this is where I'm really baffled and confused. A man mm -hmm. gives you verses for you to answer and you don't know what the questions are when it comes to those verses. So how are you going to answer them? So why do he give you Isaiah 42? Uh, that he's, you know, that yeah, he's been me telling that Isaiah 42 clearly talks about Muhammad. Okay. That's why he said. All right. Well, yeah. let him call. Let him call him. See, say my friend's here live, and he'll answer your questions. Yeah. Let's see. Call him so he can hear. Let's so say, say, man, do you want to be on Facetime with me, or do you want to call on Skype, and my friend will answer mm -hmm. you? Because these are pathetic objections by this Italian who converted to Islam. So if he's an Italian Muslim, he converted to Islam. Yeah. Let's see. Monica, how are you? Yeah, yeah I'm good. Um, I'm live uh, on Skype with a friend. And uh, you, would you mind, like, um, asking the question you asked me to him? He will probably, like, answer. Are you good with that? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. You know, because the, the dude is, like, live right now. We can ask him, like, Couple of questions he's gonna answer yeah. you. Unless he wants to call me on Skype, or he can, we can hear him. I mean, you can. He can hear me. <clears throat> no, like the same, the same, the, the, the same question you asked me like uh, Friday. You can ask ask it to him right now. How about it? Or you, or or you can. Uh, I'll give him. I'll give you his Skype, and uh, we can do that. Are you down right now? No, no, no you have Skype. So you want to call? You want to talk to him right now, or can he hear me to respond? He can. Uh... Yeah, sorry guys. The doctrine of the Trinity, okay? Yeah. So... Okay, my friend. Okay, like he he kind of hears it right now. So my friend here is asking the uh, resume of the doctrine of the Trinity. You know, yeah. Before I go, on, can he hear me? Can he hear me? Say, can he hear me? Just acknowledge as if he can hear my voice. Can you, okay. can you hear me clearly or a little bit? Can you hear me clearly? Yo, he's talking to you, bro. Hello? Yeah, can you hear me? Okay, good. So in case if we can't hear him, you repeat. Okay, what about the doctrine of the Trinity? <clears throat> what about the doctrine of, like, just, just to explain the concept of the... Uh, the Trinity, and where does the, like Jesus fall into that? And the, the you used to be a Catholic? You used to be a Catholic? Sorry? You used to be a Catholic? Uh, yeah, my family's Catholic. And so you didn't study what the Trinity was and its biblical basis, and you converted to Islam without knowing what the Trinity was first? 
No, I, I know what it is. I was just like okay. to see define it. Define it for me. Okay, define the Trinity for me so I can see if you do know. What is the Trinity? Um, define it. Uh, God the Father and God the Son are co equal, co eternal, and uh, basically the salvation that comes from believing in the cross, on the concept of the cross. So that's it, because the Trinity is more than that. What does it mean, God the Father, God the Son? What do you mean by that? What? What do you mean by God the Father, God the Son? You said you know what it is, so explain it. Just to say God the Father, God the Son doesn't explain much, because you said you know what the Trinity is. So I'm going by what you said. Define it more accurately. If you were catechized as a Catholic, you would know this. Uh, no, I never really, when I was a Catholic, when I was younger, I didn't really uh, indulge in the studies in those, yeah. these two uh, Catholic sources. Okay, so, so now, but, uh, let me ask you a question. So without studying what the Catholic Church teaches thoroughly, without first studying it, you jumped on board and studied another religion, embraced it, and even though you, obviously from your question, you haven't studied Islam too well either, because to ask me about the Trinity shows that you don't know what the Trinity is. And secondly, and I say this because I'm trying to help you, you have your own Trinity, but the Muslims haven't told you about it. You have a Trinity of your own. You have a Trinity as a Muslim of your own, but I'm sure the Muslims didn't tell you, right? Yeah, well, I, I guess I already saw that video with uh, David Woods or whatever, so oh, yeah. what's the Muslim Trinity? You, so you so you believe the Quran, just curiously, because unless you're a Quran-only Muslim or a Shia, but if you're a Sunni... No, 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 Sunni uh, okay. So you believe what the Ahl al-Sunnah wa Jama'at teach about the Quran is Kalam Allah. It's the speech of Allah. It's uncreated, right? Yeah. Okay, so now help me understand your logic because you say Allah is one. Is the Quran Allah? The Quran is Allah? No, no, it's not. Okay, but wait, is, so follow with me. I'm, I'm, uh, so it's not Allah, but it's uncreated, right? It's eternal. It's uncreated? Not only a revelation, it's a speech, and kalam being an attribute of Allah means it's uncreated. It has no beginning, because none of Allah's attributes are created. So the Quran is uncreated, right? The Quran is uncreated, okay. I mean, yeah, you, sure. you're saying, okay, yeah, sure, but you're a Sunni, so you should be, yes, alhamdulillah, it is uncreated. That should be your response, right? Yeah, which is, me, me, I just said, okay, give me a reason, because right now I really don't have much time, so mm -hmm. all I wanted to know was like, uh, how you guys would uh, describe the Trinity because that's the yeah. most important thing. Like, I'm not getting, going into a debate right now. I don't it's not a debate. It. It's just a, yeah, I'm not. I don't have the time. So, obviously, yeah. the main questions would be just give me the foundation. You know? yeah. The foundation, so well, if you don't have time. You so that you can explain better than him. So, okay, listen. give me the foundation and I would appreciate it. And that's it. Yeah, but you're, you're talking over me. I can't give you a foundation if you don't have time. If you're sincere, sit. We'll spend time because I can't give you a foundation of a, the Trinity in two minutes. So do you really want to know or are you doing it because you want to try to prove it's wrong? So make time. When can you call back and make time? Uh, we'll try to do something this weekend. Okay. Are you in Montreal? Or? No, no. You can, he'll give you what you do is download Skype. It's free. It's www.skype.com. He'll give you my name. You call me because if you really want to know, we're going to need to spend hours. So someone wants to know about the Trinity, doesn't say, I don't have time. Give it to me in a minute. It's like me saying, I don't have time. Explain to me how the Quran can be uncreated and still Allah be one if it's not the Quran, if it's not Allah. So he'll give you my Skype name, download it, contact me, and we'll take it from there. Okay, very good. So I'm going to contact with my friend and okay, we'll give it up. You got it. Peace. All right. Take care. All right. Ciao, bro. Take you later. Ciao. So yeah, thank you, sir, for that. All let right, me, so my me, friend, let me let me advise you. Let me advise you. Uh, yeah, for sure. Okay, my friend, stop being lazy when it comes to your faith. You mm -hmm. need to start studying your faith seriously, and you need to spend more time studying these sessions because everything you ask me, we've answered. So Matthew fifteen twenty four. I've been only sent to the lost sheep of Israel. Why does a Muslim have to quote to you your Bible and catch you by surprise mm -hmm. and you do not answer? Right. Yeah, so you need to now be intentional and in now studying your faith. Stop with being lazy because you got three hours to be in the gym. You don't have three hours mm -hmm. to sit and watch and learn. Yep, sure. Okay, so start learning your faith. Give them my Skype, mm -hmm. have them contact me, and I'll take it from there. 
because what a shame an Italian left the Trinity, the triune God, for Islam. Mm -hmm. What a shame. And what a shame. He doesn't know Islam. He doesn't know uh, his own religion with great depth, but he studied enough to attack Christianity because obviously he's listening to some apologist or someone telling mm -hmm. him what to say in order to get Christians confused, to get them to doubt. And it worked because it confused you. Yeah. You're right. Yes. So, so I'll have to go watch in, um, the yes. rest of uh, Start the watching, sessions. man. Start and, watching. Yeah, yeah. Because if I come and back and you ask me... On this one too. Brother, if I you come back and ask me a question, I'm answered, I'll be very angry with you. Very angry. I get it. Okay, brother. So make sure he calls me. Don't let him run. Because if mm -hmm. he's open, we'll answer his questions by the grace of the Lord Jesus. Destroy the lies and the blasphemy. And show him he made the biggest mistake following Muhammad, a son of Satan. Okay? Yeah, okay. for sure. Thank you very much. I'll okay. tune in on the rest of the session. Okay, brother. God bless you and stay strong. Okay. Thank care. you. Bye -bye. All right, guys. All right. Okay, now for the rest of you, did you see something and learn something? Did you see what I've been saying? I've been saying this for the longest time, okay? And I asked the Holy Spirit to enable me to recall scriptures perfectly, not to forget. Please, Holy Spirit, perfect this gift in me for the glory of Jesus, not for the praise of men. I beg you. I depend on you in Jesus' name. Here's what you just learned today. You saw an Italian Catholic, an Italian Catholic who left Catholicism because he was ignorant. Did you hear what he said? I don't know. You Catholics, did you hear he admit he was never catechized. He didn't study what he believed as a Catholic. So now, now that he became a Muslim, now he's learning how to attack Christianity. So instead of studying Catholicism in order to understand it, to believe it, he left Catholicism, became Muslim, and now studying Christianity to attack it. Do you see the difference now? Do you understand? Okay, this is another indication and in why it illustrates my frustration. Okay, let me let me explain to you something. Okay, let me explain to you something. Why do I get frustrated? Why do I get angry? Why do I lose my patience? Why do I sound like an angry person? Even a Jehovah Witness said on Greg Stafford's live stream, he said, Sam Shimon is an angry person, right? Someone else said it actually, Kevin. Some guy named Kevin, in response to a guy named George Lopez, he said, Sam Shimon is an angry person. Yes, I am angry. I'll be honest with you. I'll be very honest. I'm very angry. I'm frustrated. I get angry. I get disappointed. I get sad. And I lose patience. Do you know why? Here's why. In the 90s, when we came into, the, into apologetics, we didn't have what we have now on the Internet. Internet was just catching on. Listen to what I'm saying, guys. The internet was just catching on, okay? The internet was just catching on. We didn't have these websites that you have today. We had to actually go and hunt down books from Christian bookstores, Muslim bookstores, because in my area, those of you who are from Chicago, those of you who are from Chicago will confirm, on Devon Street, many of you from Chicago know Devon Street. On Devon Street, there was a Muslim bo bookstore called Ikra. I don't know if it's closed down, right? Because if you go on Devon by California Avenue, okay? Devon, I'm even giving you the location. Devon and California Avenue. I don't know if it's there anymore. I haven't been there for a year. There's a huge Muslim bookstore called Ikra. In the 90s, it was on a side street. It was small, and then it started expanding. I'd have to go to that Muslim bookstore. H. Fell, do you want me to block you and get you the hell out of here? for slandering the Christians here, H. Val, we got Catholics here and no one's insulting them. Do you need attention? Okay. My goodness. Who's insulting Catholics here? Sorry about that, guys. This guy with his, uh, another sissified, sissified, effeminate Christian. Do you get to the Catholic here? That's stupid, man. We're talking about something serious and this idiot the stupid, right, effeminate is complaining. Who's getting attacked? We got Catholics here. 
And now you, here's another example why. You see, I get angry. Yeah. Do me a favor. Forget Yitzchak Kaduri, please. Don't mention Yitzchak Kaduri. It's not about Yitzchak Kaduri. Focus what I'm trying to say. In the 90s, in the 90s, we'd have to go and buy these books and hunt down this information to learn. You guys live at a time. You don't need to do any of that. You don't need to do any of that. You know that? You know why? Now, in 2020, you got websites galore, even Muslim websites, that are now placing all their hadiths online for free, like sunnah.com, S-U-N-N-A-H.com. Go there, sunnah.com. All the major collection of the hadiths in English online for free. I had to buy volumes of them. David Wood had to buy volumes of them. It's free. And you got the beauty of YouTube. You got hundreds of thousands of videos. Some bad, some good. Some from heretics, some from sound Christians. Thoroughly equipping you by the power of the Holy Spirit, by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, to learn how to respond to these objections. You have no excuse. So for this young man, Christian, tell me, Oh, I brought up Matthew 15, 24. How frustrating, man. How frustrating. Are we wasting time? Are we wasting time writing articles? Are we wasting time doing videos? Answering these common objections over and over and over and over again? Right? So here you got an Italian who left Catholicism for Islam. Now, you Catholics, that should really tick you off. That should really upset you and anger you. That some of your parishes are not doing their job. They're not catechizing people, right? I'm not saying all, but let's be realistic. Satan is infiltrating all the major branches of Trinitarian churches. And this is not just my perspective. Taylor Marshall, convert to Catholicism. Michael Voris of Church Militant. Two men I love. I love these guys. Okay? I love these guys. I love Taylor Marshall. I love him. He wrote a book, Infiltration, right? And Michael Voris, they're telling you that Satan has crept in with corrupt, evil, filthy wolves in sheep's clothing, masquerading as priests and bishops, cardinals, to destroy the church from within. Right? But there are still solid churches that still believe in the core doctrines of the Christian faith and still affirm the historic, traditional view of Christians whether Roman Catholic or Orthodox or Syrian Church or Coptic or Protestants, right? It's just it's true, right? Michael Voris is a diehard Roman Catholic. He loves the Roman Catholic Church. Taylor Marshall loves the Roman Catholic Church. These people love their church. They're not attacking it, but they're being honest. They're telling you it's infiltrated. And don't be surprised that these major Trinitarian churches, Trinitarian, who worship and love and adore the one true triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit, would be infiltrated. Let me give you a passage from Scripture. Let me give you a passage from Scripture. Acts 20, 27 to 29. Acts 20, 27 to 29. We will, Walter. We're going to have a study. Just be patient. Let me put things in perspective so we don't get angry, right? Acts 20, 27, 29. Read, guys, please, and thank Protestants for helping me. Guys, read, read, read. For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. Now, why? Notice verse 28. For I know that after my departing, Shall grievous wolves enter among you, not sparing the flock? Did you catch it? Grievous wolves will enter among you, not sparing the flock. So they're going to be wolves in sheep's clothing who will infiltrate to destroy the church. Now let's read verse 30. Let's read verse 30. Okay. Okay, now what? Also of your own selves, even people who started out true believers from yourselves, shall men arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Acts 20, 27 to 30, but 29 was the key. See, now 30 tells you that even people who start out believing the truth, 
Now, guys, please, I need your attention. Ask the Spirit to help you to focus for the glory of Jesus by the power of the Spirit. Holy Spirit, take over and possess us fully and save us from our flesh. For the glory of Jesus, I beseech you. We need you, Holy Spirit. I'm a failure. Help me not to fail the Lord. I want you to pay attention. Verse 30 is talking about there will be people who start out believing the true faith. But then they will introduce perverse doctrines, corrupt teaching to mislead people from your midst. But I want you to catch Acts 20, 29 again. Yitzhak Kaduri, get him out of here, please. If he's going to keep starting trouble and he's going to cause division and attack people, get him out of here. See, that's another one. See, an example. Beautiful illustration. Acts 20, 29, guys. Read. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Okay, did you catch it? Grievous wolves shall enter among you, not sparing the flock. One more time. Grievous wolves shall enter among you, not sparing the flock. So Catholics, Orthodox, Protestant, if you worship the triune God, you worship and love and adore the Father, Son, and Spirit, the one triune God, three eternal distinct persons existing as one God. Guess what? Paul told you there are going to be wolves who will infiltrate. So don't be upset with Taylor Marshall, as some Catholics are, like Baron Bishop Barron, who is pretty much demonizing Taylor Marshall. Don't be upset with Michael Voris. They're not set of acantists. They're Roman Catholics who love their church and believe it's the church of Jesus Christ, but they're not blind. They see the satanic infiltration, homosexual clergy, homosexual bishops and cardinals, Satanists filled with the devil, infiltrating to destroy and shame the church. Okay? And it's not just Catholic church. It's the Orthodox. It's the Protestant. It's the Assyrian church. It's the Coptic church. Okay. Yes, Cherubel, of course, it's going to prevail. You know why? Because Jesus Christ is God Almighty. In fact, let me show you how the Lord Jesus ensures that his true church will never be destroyed. I don't know if you paid attention, Acts 20, 28. One more time. Acts 20, 28. Acts 20, 28. Watch here. Watch here. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers. That's the answer. To feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. God Almighty will raise up true shepherds, true bishops, true overseers, true ministers who truly love Jesus, who are truly born of the Spirit and filled with the Holy Spirit, and they will be empowered by the Spirit to save the flock from being destroyed. You caught it? So look to people like Michael Voris and Taylor Marshall as men being empowered by the Holy Spirit to sound the warning signal. Christians, Trinitarians, Catholics, be aware. Those are wolves. Those are Satans pretending to be men of God. The watchman, right? Okay. Now. Okay, so H. Fowl, stop whining, dude. Be a brother in Christ. Gird up your loins. No one's going to attack any Trinitarian church here. I've said it. My YouTube channel is for all Trinitarians who are in love with Jesus, who love the triune God, who worship the triune God, and are born of the Spirit. I don't care if it's Catholic, Orthodox, Coptic, Syrian Church of the East, Protestant. As long as you worship and love and adore the triune God and believe the Bible is the perfect, preserved Word of God. Okay, that's just channels for you. So no one's going to attack anyone here. I don't tolerate that. I don't like that. I, and unfortunately, I do see Orthodox attacking Catholics and Protestant, Catholics attacking Orthodox and Protestants, and Protestants attacking. I see it. And unfortunately, years ago, years ago, I used to attack the Catholic Church. I really did because I really thought that it was evil and corrupted by Satan. I, I really do. I did. I can't lie. And I could. I was very harsh. But, you know, I hope as I'm getting older, I hope as I'm getting older, 
I'm becoming more like Jesus and wiser and more filled with the Holy Spirit and not less, and I'm not falling away. That's my hope and trust in the Holy Spirit to make me more like Jesus and to see the truth more clearly. So I hope this path I'm taking is of the Holy Spirit. And I'm tr trusting the Holy Spirit will save me from compromise, from selling out and perverting myself because I don't trust myself. I'll be honest with you guys. I don't trust myself. If you guys know the sins I struggle with, the sinful passions that I struggle with, succumb to, you'd be disgusted with me and disgusted for me. Yesterday was a day from hell struggling with my sinful passion. And I want to be a pure, holy slave of Jesus and love with Jesus, filled with the Holy Spirit. And I beg the Holy Spirit not to give me what I deserve, but give me his grace and perfect these gifts in me to then truly live it out for the glory and honor and majesty of our God and Savior, the Lord Jesus. Truly. Right? Truly. It sucks being in this flesh. It sucks succumbing to the flesh. It sucks disappointing Jesus and failing Jesus. It sucks, man. You hate your life. Right? And you wonder why I'm angry. Now, with that said, let's answer a question that came up. God willing, I haven't listened to Shibrali, that charlatan. I have now publicly challenged Shibrali on his Facebook page, and I called him out on four debate topics, and I said, put me in my place. Stop hiding behind your computer screen, doling me to your fan base. It's time for you to debate me. Put me in my, in my place, and I promise you, by the grace of our God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, I will end his career as a Muslim apologist by the power of the living Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit, not trusting in me, I will destroy his arguments and blasphemies and send him packing and discredit him for the glory of Jesus if that coward steps up and debates me. So don't let him use an excuse that I'm harsh and I'm not respectful. You cannot respect swine like him, a charlatan like him, a demon like him. It's the fault of Christians that respect him and give him a platform. That's someone you have to de destroy spiritually and this decimate his argument so lord willing i'm going to be doing a session responding to his debate review of the jay dyer debate where jay dyer spanked him and humiliated him and send him packing i'm going to do it so he did it today i didn't hear all of it but rias told me that he brought up one of these arguments that have been answered over and over again so let me answer it for your benefit here's the argument okay are you ready now rias make sure that I'm not misrepresenting his argument because I'm going to listen to it thoroughly, take notes, and by the power of the triune God, by the power of Jesus Christ, Muhammad's God, judge, and destroyer, I will utterly refute his lies, his distortion, his blasphemy. I have no respect for him, none, and you shouldn't respect him either. Okay. Now, he claimed again, if Jesus is God and God died, if Jesus God God died, how did how can God die? Was that his argument? Who was running the universe? He brought that up again, right? He brought that up again, right? Even though he's heard the answer over and over and over again, right? So is Riaz here? Yes, he brought it up, right? He, okay, so he just confirmed it. Riaz, my mod just confirmed it. Now he knows the answer because he's received the answer over and over and over again. Well, let me answer it again. The question assumes that if Jesus died, he ceased to exist. Okay, guys, please hear me out. Many of you already know the argument, but we're creatures of repetition. We need to hear something over and over and over again until it becomes second nature for the glory of Jesus Christ. Okay. The question assumes that when we speak of physical death, we're like Joe's witnesses or seven-day Adventists who think that when you die, you cease to exist, either soul sleep or you're completely annihilated until God chooses to recreate you. That is not the biblical teaching on physical death, nor is it the Quranic teaching. Now, let me show you how to expose this charlatan, that he's a deceiver and a tool of the devil, because his God is the devil, not the true God of Abraham. Now, first, last, are you here? Can you post chapter 2, verse 154 of the Quran? Chapter 2, verse 154 of the Quran. Chapter 2, verse 154, if you can post it. Is he here first, last, or somebody? 
post the Quran a lot. I'll read it. I'm just saying. We may have a Muslim calling me in so I can ask his questions, answer his question. Kiri alaysun, kiri alaysun, kiri alaysun. Okay. Okay, let's see. Did someone post it? Oh my goodness. Sorry. Anybody here? Any mod here? Or you guys checked out? You get raptured? Hello, mods. Protestant for Slash. Who's here? Hello. Chapter 2, verse 154 of the Quran. If you can't do it, let me know. I'll post it. Chapter 2, verse 154. Thank you, Isabella. God bless you, sister. Well, if one of the mods don't post it, then, you know. You, you, I don't pay these guys nothing, and they still do a terrible job for getting paid nothing. Right, Thomas? Shh, tell me about it, dude. Guy, before the rapture, Protestant, before. Okay, thank you. See? Okay, guys, read with me. Chapter 2, verse 154. Regroup and focus by the grace of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Chapter 2, verse 154. And do not say of those who are killed for the sake of Allah, dead. Yet they are alive, but you do not feel. Ah, this was Sama Taktok. It's too literal. Guys, notice what the Quran says. Do not say of those who are killed for the sake of Allah, dead. Yet they are alive, but you do not feel. Did you guys catch it? Do you see what it said? Do not say about those who are killed in the way of Allah, they are dead. Rather, they are alive, but you perceive it not. You see what the Quran says? So, Jesus was killed for the sake of God, meaning the Father. So, according to the Quran, since Jesus was killed voluntarily, chose to die and be killed, to fulfill God's will. Do not say he's dead. Okay, now, chapter 3 of the Quran, verses 169 to 170. Chapter 3 of the Quran, verses 169 to 170. Okay, follow with me. Chapter 3, verses 169 and 170. Hopefully someone will post it before the rapture so we don't leave anyone behind. Okay? Chapter 3, verses 169 and 170. Watch here. Now, Shabir knows the answer because I gave it to him in my first public debate, which was with him, that charlatan. Ever since then, he's been avoiding me like the plague. Okay. Think not of those who are slain in the way of Allah. Thank you, Snow Leopard. By the time the mods post, forget about it. Right? The Antichrist will show up. Think not of those who are slain in the way of Allah as dead. Nay, they are living. Nay, they are living. With their Lord, they have provision. They are alive with their Lord. They have provision. Now, here is the Sama Daktok translation, right? And do not think that those who are killed for the sake of Allah, dead, yet they are alive with their Lord, receiving their provision. Okay, now 170, rejoicing in what Allah has given them from his bounty, and they receive the good news of those who do not follow them from behind, except fear on them. And they will not grieve. Now, Snow Leopard is posting another version, chapter 3, verse 170, and Snow Leopard's version. Jubilant are they because of that which Allah hath bestowed upon them of his bounty, rejoicing for the sake of those who have not joined them but are left behind, that there shall no fear come upon them, neither shall they grieve. Now, did you guys understood? Write these down. Chapter 2, verse 154 of the Quran. Chapter 3, verses 169 to 170 of the Quran. Chapter 2, verse 154. Chapter 3, verses 169 to 170. Both of those passages state, those killed in the way of Allah, they are alive, not dead. But hold on, their bodies were killed. Their bodies are buried. Yeah, the bodies are dead and buried, but they are still alive as disembodied souls, spirits. Okay, everyone got that so far? Before I move on to the next point. Everyone got that? The Quran does not define physical death as secession of life, ceasing to consciously live. Now, with that said, does the Bible agree? Let's go to the Gospel of John, chapter 2, verses 19 to 22. Now focus, for the glory of Jesus, don't let Satan distract you. Okay? Chapter 2, verses 19 22 of the Gospel of John. Aleph, you better start chilling, not distracting and focus. We're going to chill you and send you out of here. Chapter 2, verses 19 to 22. Read. Okay, read. Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple in three days. I will raise it up. 
you destroy the temple and I will personally raise it up. Then said the Jews, 40 and six years was this temple in building and wilt thou, you, you will rear it up in three days? You're going to raise it up? They, they thought he's talking about the physical temple in Jerusalem. But he spake of the temple of his body. When therefore he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this unto them and they believed the scripture and the word what Jesus had said. So folks, let me ask you a question. How could the Lord Jesus Christ personally resurrect his temple, his physical body from death if he wasn't still alive, if he wasn't still conscious and he wasn't sustaining creation, sustaining his body in the grave. How could he do that? Before I move on. So even though he died physically, he died a human death, he was still alive still conscious, still in control, still sustaining creation, and still preserving his body in the tomb. But now, the response that Shabir gave me in my debate was, well, see, that's the Gospel of John. It's later and more theologically developed. You, you get it now, right? So he's asking you to answer a question. You then answer from the Bible, oh, but I won't accept it because John is later. So damn if you do, damn if you don't. Two responses. Are you ready? Two responses to that. Are you ready for my responses to this charlatan, this demon, the son of Satan? Are you ready? Two responses. Number one, whether John is later or not, John still gives us the answer about the nature of physical death. Whether John is later or not, that's still irrelevant to the question. Does physical death mean you cease to exist? And the answer is no. You don't cease to exist consciously. You continue to exist as a disembodied spirit slash soul. So your spirit, your soul still lives and is still conscious, though your body returns to dust. Number two, it's not just John. It isn't simply John. Because you find something stated in Matthew and Mark. To the same effect. So are you now ready for the second response? No, it is not true that John is the one that has Jesus saying this. And John is later. And therefore somehow because he's later, he's less reliable. Which begs the question. If John is not as reliable because he's later in time. Where Muhammad is and deserves to be. Because Muhammad comes when? When does Muhammad come? Over 600 years later, and yet Shabir trusts what Muhammad has to say about the historical Jesus. You catch it? Hold on one second. One second about that. Oh, sorry about that. Sorry about that. Apologize, guys. That's what happens when you're live. You get distracted. Okay, so understand the implication here. Sorry about that. Okay. If John is less reliable... Okay, Cast, when I answer you, I'm going to muzzle you like a dog, Cast, okay? I'm going to muzzle you like a dog. When Jesus said, destroy this temple and I will raise it up in three days, was Jesus didn't knew nothing, Cast? We got another filthy, wicked demon. These dogs, dude, seriously, disgust me. Cast, when Jesus said, destroy this temple and I will raise it up in three days, he knew nothing because he was dead? Cast, can you actually call me so I can embarrass you? And I record your voice as you get embarrassed by misapplying Ecclesiastes chapter 9, right? Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verses 4 and 5, because that's what you're referring to. Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verses 4 and 5. Okay, hold on, guys. This is why I love the live streams, because when demons come, we muzzle them by the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you wonder why I have no respect for these people and why. Okay, call me right now, Cass. 
Call me. You better call me, and you better have your Bible open, or I'm going to send you packing. Okay? Call me. Yes, call me, and get your Bible open. Get ready, guys. We have a customer. These guys disgust me. Okay, hold on. I'll show you from Mark that Jesus affirmed that Mark, Jesus affirmed that saying that if you destroy his body, he'll raise it up in three days. But understand the argument of Shibra Ali. Because John is later, he's less reliable. So that means he just buried Muhammad in the pit of hell where he belongs. Because Muhammad comes 600 years later, and yet Shabir believes what Muhammad says, Jesus said 600 years earlier. Do you see why he's an inconsistent troll, a tool of the devil that you should not respect? You see that, right? If John, who's a first century writer, can't be trusted to tell you what the historical Jesus said, but Muhammad, who comes 600 years later, he can be trusted because he received wahi. No, brother, Allah sent down to him the wahi revelation. So Muhammad didn't have to be there. Allah could tell him what Jesus said 600 years earlier, but God couldn't do that for John. So God could only send down revelation to Muhammad about what Jesus said 600 years later. But for some reason, Shabir's God was incapacitated, handicapped to send down revelation to John to tell John what Jesus said 60 years earlier. Brother, this is why Allah is amazing. Okay. This is why Allah is amazing. Brother, we're waiting for this guy called to call. You get it? Yeah. So, but anyway, with that said, until he calls, let me show you where Matthew and Mark, Matthew and Mark make allusion to Jesus' saying. Are you ready? Mark 14, 57 and 58. Mark 14, 57. Okay. Cast, I know you're illiterate because the way you read the Bible shows you're illiterate. Here it goes, Cast. Have your Bible ready, and you better get ready to answer questions. Any underscore Malik three. Okay. Oh, boy. Sorry, guys. If I have to go for the juggler, don't be upset with me. Mark 15, 14, 57 and 58. And there arose certain and bare false witness against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and within three days I will build another made without hands. So catch that. What they're accusing Jesus at his trial now, Mark 15, 29, Mark 15, 29, and I'll unpack this once I'm done with this clown who thinks he knows the Bible, okay? Mark 15, 29, by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Mark 15, 29, I'll unpack, I'll unpack what it means and it doesn't mean. Mark 15, 29, and they that passed by railed on him, wag wagging their heads and saying, Ah, thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days. See, they're making fun of him. You said you're going to build the temple in three days. You can't even save yourself from the cross. You get me there? You see what the accusation is, right? They're accusing Jesus. They're accusing Jesus of saying that he would destroy the temple in Jerusalem and build it up in three days. Right? And so now they're mocking him for that saying. They go, look, you who are going to destroy the temple, raise it up three days. You can't even save yourself from hanging on the cross. Now I'm going to explain. Oh, my goodness, this guy. What a joke this guy is. You better call me in five minutes, Cass, or I'm going to send you back to Mecca, Mecca Wish Foundation. Okay, now. Uh, Mason, are you saying I'm rightfully harsh with them? Glory to Jesus Christ. Because you need to be harsh because I'm tired of sissified, effeminate Christians being nice to people like Shabir. You want to be that? Go somewhere else. Now, for the rest of you, focus, okay? Now, someone will catch me and say, oh, but it says they were bearing false witness. They were lying about what Jesus said. So here's where I need you to pay attention. If you want to learn Scripture and you want to go deep in Scripture and unpack the meat of Scripture and properly interpret Scripture, I need you to pay attention by the power of the Spirit for the glory of Jesus Christ because I know this stuff. I want you to learn it. Let's go back to Mark 15, 14, Mark 14, 57 to 58. Mark 14, 14, 57 to 58. His Holy Spirit controls my tongue and loosens it to speak clearly for the glory of Christ. One more time. Mark 14, 57 to 58. They'll say, ah, 
Look, it was a lie. Jesus didn't say it. And there arose certain and bear false witness against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and within three days I will build another made without hands. So they'll say, see, they're lying. Jesus never said it. They're bearing false witness, lying in order to condemn him falsely. Now, you guys listening, how to respond to this? Because some critics say this shows that what John had Jesus say in John 2 cannot be true because Mark says this was a false accusation. Jesus did not go around saying, destroy this temple and I will raise it up in three days. Because Mark says that's what they falsely accused them of. And Jesus never actually said it. Okay. How to respond to that? If you're not paying attention, you won't know how to respond to that. Okay. Number one, when the Bible speaks of false witnesses, it does not necessarily mean a witness that lies. Okay. Now get Alias out of here. Send him back to hell, to Asheron. Get him out of here. Okay. He's a distraction of the devil. Okay. Now for the rest of you, a false witness in scripture doesn't mean a witness who lies. A false witness in scripture means a witness that is hostile. A witness that seeks <clears throat> to cause you harm and get you in trouble who's hostile. He's not impartial. He's not unbiased. He's a witness that seeks you harm seeks to get you in trouble, in prison, and or kill. He's not impartial. He's not simply giving impartial testimony. A hostile witness with malintent. Are you with me there? Okay, here we go, Cat. Let's deal with this con. Okay. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah, can you hear me? I think it's much better now. Yes, I can hear you. Go to the Gospel of John, chapter 2, verses 19 and 22. Okay. Yeah. John 2. Yeah. Uh, base 19, you said? 2, 19 and 22. Okay. All right. Uh, it says, uh, Jesus answered. I'm using the NIV version. You can use whatever, Jehovah Witness. I'm glad you're a Jehovah Witness because we're not fun with you. Uh, no, I'm not a Jehovah's Witness. Oh, yes, I'm, you are uh, because when you said I'm using an IV, you're an anti Trinitarian. But go ahead, read. <laughs> but we'll see. <laughs> Keep laughing. Go ahead. Uh, Jesus answered, Destroy this temple, and I will raise it again in three days. Okay, let me ask you a question. Did Jesus know nothing when he was dead? Because he said he's going to raise it in three days. Well, no, don't give me well. Did Jesus know nothing when he was dead? Because he said he's going to raise it when you destroy his body. I'm not really sure. I, I cannot say that because, you know, you're not uh, really sure. speaking from the standpoint. Uh, wait, before you go down that road, uh, we are speaking from the standpoint that Jesus Christ is part of the Godhead. So, okay, so was he alive? I cannot go into. Was he alive? But my question... I'll get to your question. Yes, he was dead. He I'll was get, dead. I'll get you to Ecclesiastes 9. Was he alive when his body was in the tomb? If you're going to use Jesus Christ as an example, then yeah. we must be in the same state as him. No, you don't, you don't have to be the same thing. Don't, friend, the don't head. talk over me. Don't change the subject. Listen, because we're going to go to Ecclesiastes 9. I'm going to show you how you perverted it. Just be patient. Okay. So just admit okay. Jesus was alive and conscious when his body was in the tomb. Uh, right? I'm not sure about that. So you're yeah, not sure I'm when sure Jesus this says, destroy being. this temple and I will raise it up. How will he raise up his body if he's not alive and conscious? Don't tell me you're mentally challenged. No, I'm not. Okay. I'm How saying, could he do it if he's not I alive or conscious? Jesus, I believe that Jesus Christ is part of the Godhead. Okay. So I didn't ask what you believe. Let me repeat it again. Was he alive or conscious when his body was in the tomb? I would say he was dead. Was he alive or conscious when his body was in the tomb? Was he alive? Because how does he raise himself to life if he's not consciously alive? How does someone who is dead consciously 
know enough to raise himself on the third day. How does he know it's the third day? It's, it's very simple. No, it's you not know, simple. Has, no, it's not simple. Is he, is he is alive or he is dead consciously? Stop the tap dance, dude. Answer directly. He's dead. He's dead. So that means Jesus said you're a liar and you're a son of Satan because he says he's alive because he has to be alive and conscious to raise his body back to life. Now go to Ecclesiastes 9, 4 to 5, so I can bury you in Ecclesiastes. Okay. Yeah, it's what I do. People it, think it, they know the Bible. Go there. Go to Ecclesiastes 9, 4 to 5. This is what I do to people who think they know the Bible. When you pontificate, yeah. you're going to get schooled. Go to Ecclesiastes 9, 4 to 5. I don't want to hear your opinion. I want you to deal with the text. First of all, I'd like to say one thing. I'm here to Go to Ecclesiastes 9, I'm verses sure 4 to 5. I want to say it again, friends. Go to Ecclesiastes 9. Don't I'm, preach. I'm there. I'm there. I'll Go to Ecclesiastes 9, verses 4 and 5. You, you, Read it for you me. You are quite arrogant in this because you are... You are a bad. son of the devil. You suck. Read Ecclesiastes 9, I 4 to 5. 9, 45. All right. There we go. Uh, uh, 9, 45. 9, verses 4 to 5. Uh, it could just, just because that's the passage you're, you don't even know the passage you're alluding to but go ahead read it no 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 ah, that, okay 4 to 5 All right. Right. verses 4 to uh, 5 anyone who is among the living has hope even a, even a live dog is better than, uh, than a dead lion for the living know that they will die but the dead know nothing that's what you're referring to hope. now do you understand? Do you understand the genre of Ecclesiastes or no? Do you know what the purpose of Ecclesiastes or no? No, no, I don't. Okay, good. But that's the passage you referred to to make your doctrine. Now, can you go to Ecclesiastes three, verses nineteen to twenty-one, so I can explain to you? Never use Ecclesiastes to your shame and humiliation. Ecclesiastes three, verses nineteen to twenty-one. Three verses nineteen to twenty-one. All right. Yeah. All right. Read it for me. So, uh, 19 to 21, all right, going. Uh, surely the fate of human being is like that of the animals. The same fate awaits them both. As one dies, so does the other. All have the same breath. Humans have no advantage over animals. Everything is meaningless. All go to the same place, all come from dust, and dust all returns. Who knows if the human spirit rises upwards and if the spirit of the animal goes down into the earth. Okay, now he's asking a question. <clears throat> he's saying, does someone know whether the spirit of man goes upward and the spirit of the beast goes down to the earth? He's asking a question. But then go to Ecclesiastes 12, verse 7. <clears throat> Ecclesiastes 12, verse right. 7. 12, verse 7. Just a sec. 12 verse 7, all right? And the dust returns to the ground it came from, and the spirit returns to God who gave it. Okay, he just said the spirit does go up to God who gave it, but in Ecclesiastes 3.21, he's not certain. Does it go upward, and the spirit of the animal returns to the dust? Can you now explain this contradiction? Because now in Ecclesiastes 12.7, he knows where the spirit of man goes. It goes back to God who gave it. So now can you reconcile the contradiction? Okay. Okay. Uh, I, I am of the understanding that man is not just, man is both uh, the living soul, I would say. I didn't ask you what you understood. I said reconcile Ecclesiastes 12.7 with Ecclesiastes 3.20. I know you have a hard time hearing. I don't care for yeah. your opinion. Give me, how do you reconcile Ecclesiastes 12? Opinion. Ecclesiastes I'm, I'm 12, let opinion. me say it again. Ecclesiastes 12, verse 7 with Ecclesiastes 3.21. 21 and chapter 3, he doesn't know if the spirit goes up. But here he does know in Ecclesiastes 12, 7, that the spirit does go back to God who gave it. How do you reconcile those two passages? Don't preach to me. I'm not a member of your false church. Reconcile okay. these two passages. All right. I do. And, okay. How do I reconcile them? 
uh, I think the context of the spirit going back to 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 God is, uh, I, I, in my understanding, is is the breath, the ruach, going back to the breath of life. But that's not what I ask you. See, again, you think you're answering my question. In Ecclesiastes three twenty one, he says he doesn't know whether the ruach goes up, the ruach of man goes up, and whether the ruach of the beast goes to the earth. But then in Ecclesiastes twelve seven. He now knows it does go up. See, you think you're listening, but you're not. So let me try it again. How do you reconcile Ecclesiastes 12, 7, where he says the Ruach of man does go back to God, so it does go up to God, whereas in Ecclesiastes 3, 21, he wasn't certain if it does go up. You didn't answer the question. You think you're answering by telling me what you think Ruach means. It means breath, and I'm going to bury you on that as well. Reconcile okay. the contradiction. Okay. Uh, maybe I can't. Uh, I don't know. Say it again. I don't know precisely. I, yeah, maybe I can't reconcile okay, it good. Uh, to my understanding. But I think I think partly because uh, uh, you're putting too much unnecessary pressure with unnecessary language. Because I'm no, to you're to putting too much. You know, you hypocrite. You're the one who put too much on Ecclesiastes nine verse five. You wicked hypocrite. You're the one who I'm, did it. I'm, I'm, now, let me tell you, let me explain to Ecclesiastes okay, so you won't okay. make the stupid mistake of being stupid to misquote it again. Ecclesiastes, right. if you read from chapter 1 to 12, you're going to know that Solomon is telling us life apart from revelation based on human experience and observation. Start at chapter 1, read to 12, and he's telling you, here is what I have learned from my experience under the sun through human observation. Merely human observation you can't tell me if a man's fate is better than an animal because we both die and return to the dust. That's all he's saying. This is the only knowledge you can have apart from revelation based on human observation, human experience. But then in Ecclesiastes 12, he ends it by saying, now let's return to God and his revelation. And when we return to God and his revelation, we now know the spirit of man does go back to God because God has made it known to us. So don't you ever... Misquote Ecclesiastes 9, verse 5. Okay, okay, Sam. Uh, when it comes to, if I may ask, let, let, let me just have some one-to-one -one conversation. I'm not really interested in one-on-one -on -one to you. To me, you're a heretic. No, so, no, but no, make no, your question. I'm, ask your question. I'm, 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 I'm just going to ask you biblical questions. Yes, ask me one okay. at a time so I can then bury you in the biblical answers. Go ahead. Okay, okay, good, good. So, uh uh, when it comes to to sin, uh, you know, just from the, for example, comes the garden, to what? Uh, when, when it comes to uh, resurrection, okay, what we do not die, die. I'm, I'm I'm just talking about resurrection. We just okay, get to the point. Yeah, what about the resurrection? Sign. If we do not die, or we we are living in some sense, maybe going oh, to heaven. Boy, yeah. How is it resurrection important? Okay, so you sense? notice again, you misrepresented because you assume death has one meaning. Let me correct you again. Who told okay. you that death means non-existence? Why are you giving me your erroneous definition? We do die, but we don't cease to exist. You still don't get it? What? You do die, but you don't there cease to exist. exist. Let me prove it to you. Can I prove it to you? It says, so let, me, really okay, let me answer your question. Dead. Let me, unlike you, I'm going to answer from Scripture. In Ephesians okay. 2, verses 3 to 7, it says, While we were dead, God made us alive in Christ. So before you were made alive in Christ, you were dead. So that means you were a zombie, brain damaged, and you didn't have consciousness. When you were dead, before God made you alive in Christ. What does it mean you were dead? Listen to my question and answer. Don't tap dance, tap dancer. In Ephesians 2, 3 to 7, it says that at one point you were dead and then God made you alive in Christ. So before you were alive in Christ, you were dead. So that means, according to you, you had no consciousness. You were not conscious alive. And in your case, I believe it, you were yes. brain damaged. So what does it mean you were dead? No, just Death to me means non-existence. Uh, the, the state in which How can it mean non-existence when Ephesians 2, 3 to 6, it says... You were dead and then made alive in Christ. It's talking about sinners who, before they, they were saved, were dead. Not in the original sense, as you. Not in the, I don't care about original sin. I didn't bring in original sin. You were destined to die. You we, didn't I did not bring up original sin. You're not answering the passage. Let me try it again, okay. tap dancer. 
Ephesians 2, verses 3 to 7, it says, When we were dead, Christ, God made us alive in Christ. So that means before you were united to Christ, before you believed in Christ, before you were alive in Christ, you were dead. Are you telling me that all those years when you didn't believe in Jesus, you were brain dead and brain damaged and a zombie and you didn't have consciousness? Uh, no, no, no. Uh, that, 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 that speaking of death is not... I was alive at that time, of course. No, you weren't. It says you were that, dead. No, 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 no. It says you were dead. Sorry. The Bible says you were that dead. That was not a literal sense of death. You, you, you and me. It says you were death. dead. Don't redefine it. Keep with your definition of death. You said... We heard you. That that means that you don't have consciousness. Don't re redefine the term just because it suits your purpose. It says you were dead. That means you didn't have consciousness. Now go to Matthew 10, 28 so I can be done with you. Go to Matthew 10, 28. So I can send you, on your, I can send you packing. Okay? Matthew 10, 28. Well, I, I think my foot here, I, I wasn't really prepared. No, even, uh, no, you're not. I guarantee you, when you're prepared, I'll still I bury you. Prepared, but I will you're, still you're, bury you when you're prepared, you're, and I'll bury your pastor. Absolutely. Go to Matthew 10, 28. Go to Matthew 10, 28. You bring me into a whole church, and I will destroy their blasphemies by the power of God. Don't flatter yourself. You don't know the Bible. You're a joke. Go to Matthew 10, 28. Read that for me. Okay, I'm not them. Which Read Matthew 10, 28 loudly so we can hear you. I'm, not, I'm reading it. Okay, I said loudly uh, so we can hear you. Okay, okay. I'm so sorry about that. People are sleeping in there. Uh, fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. So wait, don't fear the one who kills the body, but can't kill the soul, right? Yes. yes. Okay, now let me ask you a question. When I'm you sure die, the... your soul, you said it's the breath, right? You cease to exist, right? No, 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 no. A living soul has got both. Yeah, they, they, Let me try this again. When you die, what hap What is your soul? You said it's the breath that gives you life, right? Yes, the breath. Okay. The breath of good Friend, you know Jesus just life. said you're a liar because it just said there are people who kill your body, not your soul. But according to you, when I die, my breath also ceases to be. So when someone kills me, he is killing my soul. But Jesus says there are people who kill your body who cannot kill your soul. So either Jesus is lying or you're an ignoramus. You're not of no, no, God. No, no. You're a blasphemer. You are, you are, I think you're just interpreting it. I've been mean, putting a whole bunch of words to make me feel in a certain way. You're not. You, you... Okay. There you go. Yeah. Sorry for wasting my time with this guy. Okay. These guys, I'm not prepared. I'm not prepared. So, but you'll bark in my comment section and attack scripture to try to prove your position. Okay. I'm not prepared. I'm not prepared. But yeah, yeah, I don't think you're right. Yeah. Okay. All right. For the rest of you guys, all right? Yeah. You don't like my approach with heretics? Leave my channel. I'm, I don't care. Yeah. I cowardly went away, you wicked dog. You just embarrassed yourself, you filthy dog. Get him out of here. Block this dog. See, another arrogant dog. And he says, I'm the coward. The guy who said, I'm not prepared. I'm disgusted by these heretics, dude. Okay? I am disgusted by these heretics. But these heretics, see, this is the problem with some of these heretics. They want to have formal debates where they can rant for 10 minutes. You can't stop them. They don't want where you're engaging them and you can stop them. Do you know why? Because you see, if I didn't stop him, he'd be ranting, right? I believe, I believe this, I believe that. Believe. Shut up, I don't care what you believe. Deal with the text. Okay? Anyway, Lord Jesus, be glorified. Lord Jesus, crucify our flesh. Lord Jesus, wash us in your blood. Fill us with your Holy Spirit to have holy indignation, righteous anger, not to sin in our anger, and perfect my ability, Lord, to recall the scriptures and live them for your glory. Bless us for your glory. Son of God, you are almighty to save in Jesus' name. Now. Let's come back to Mark 14, 57 and 58. Mark 14, 57 and 58. Okay, let's focus now. His entire church won't be prepared. They can study all they want. They won't be prepared. But focus, guys. Focus now. Let's answer the question.
excuse me, Mark 14, 57 and 58. And when there are all certain and bear false witness against him saying, we heard him say, this is going to be a test of your reading comprehension and your ability to focus. This is going to be a test. We heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and within three days I will build another made without hands. Now, some of the skeptics like Shabir will say, see, that proves that John 2, 19 to 22, John 2, 19 to 22 is made up, that the historical Jesus did not say, destroy this temple, I will raise it up in three days. Because Mark and Matthew, because Matthew mentions it as well, state clearly that's what false witnesses slanderously accuse Jesus of saying. False witnesses went around saying Jesus said that. And since they're false witnesses, they're lying. Jesus didn't say it. So John picked up the lie and put it in the mouth of Jesus. Do you understand the objection? You guys understand the objection? So I can walk you through it. Can I now walk you through the objection? Okay. Number one, as I said earlier, pay attention, as I said earlier, according to the Bible, a false witness is not necessarily someone who's going to lie. A false witness is someone who has malintent to cause you harm, who's not unbiased and impartial and simply reporting facts, but he's out to get you and wants to make you look as bad as possible. So a false witness can even take what you say and take it out of context. So you may have said something, but he may take it out of context in order to present it in the worst possible light. So a false witness, according to the Bible, is not someone who simply makes up what you say, but he can take what you say and take it out of context in order to present you in the worst possible light. So it's a hostile witness who's not simply giving unbiased testimony. You with me? You understand what false witness means according to the Bible? Which leads me to the second point. A false witness is also someone who will take what you say and twist it and tweak it so that even though you said something similar, he takes what you say and twist it so he ends up with, <clears throat> with something you didn't say in that exact way. In other words, a false witness is also someone who takes something you did say but twists it in order to make you say something you didn't say in that exact manner. Are you with me there? In that exact manner. You did say something similar, but you didn't say it the way the false witness is putting it. He's putting a spin on it, twisting it, taking something you did say, but twisting it to make you say something you didn't say in that exact manner. Now, let's see how many of you caught it. Mark 14, 58. Mark 14, 58. Let's see if you caught it. Look what Snow Leopard and Charbel are talking about. Snow Leopard and Charbel are talking about pre permanent residency because it's more important for Snow Leopard to get permanent residency so he can study somewhere than it is for him to learn how to interpret Scripture for the glory of Jesus and focus. And Snow Leopard has been here long enough with Charbel to know not to do that, and they did it anyway. And you tell me Christians are not stupid? Snow Leopard, tell us about your conversation that was so important that you had to talk about it and lose focus on the point. Can you tell me? Tell me what it is, because I want to be a permanent resident too. Can you tell me what it is? Because I want to be a permanent resident, because I'd rather talk about what you're talking about than talk about Jesus. No, go ahead, Snow Leopard, because you got 10 seconds, buddy. 10 seconds. You know what happens in 10 seconds, right? 10, 9. You know what's going to happen, right, Snow Leopard? 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Bye bye, Snow Leopard. Bye bye. Send him, guys. Send him. Send him. Come on, as mods, send him. Okay? All right. Now, okay, now let's go back. Mark 14, 58. No respect, honestly. 
No respect to the word of God. I don't care if you disrespect me. I'm not important. We're talking about Jesus and his word, how to interpret it, because we got heretics galore. And this guy wants to talk about present, permanent residency. And instead of Charbel saying, hey, brother, focus on Jesus, he engages him, and now his brother gets thrown out. Good job, Charbel. Good job loving your, your neighbor as yourself. Excellent. Mark 14, 58. Okay. And at least it tells you I'm an equal opportunist, unbiased, impartial blocker. Mark 14, 58. We heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and within three days I will build another made without hands. Now, okay, everyone focus. Everyone focus here. Did you see what they did? Now, I want to see how many of you are paying attention and not being distracted about having permanent residency in some state instead of having permanent residency in heaven. What did they do with the words of Jesus? Did Jesus say what they accused him of saying? Uh, he is weak. I just have to be honest. He's not a great debater. He's not one of the best. He should be teaching and preaching, not debating, to be honest with you. His gifting is not debating. What did they say that, uh, that put a spin on it? Or did Jesus say what they accused him of saying? Did Jesus say what they accused him of saying? Did he say it in the exact manner that they accused him of? How did they twist his words? Somebody's saying twisted his words. How? How? Let's look at it again. Mark 14, 58. Mark 14, 58. Let's see. Hold on. Let's see. Exactly, Masto. Masto got it. We heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and within three days I will build another made without hands. That's not what Jesus said. Jesus never said, I will destroy the temple, and I will raise it up in three days. He said, you will destroy the temple, and I will raise it up in three days. So you guys got to pay attention. No, pay attention again. He never said, I will destroy the temple made with hands, and then we'll raise the temple in three days made without hands. He never said that. He goes, destroy. You destroy the temple, and I will raise it up in three days. So what they did was, they conflated two sayings of Jesus together. Jesus did speak about coming to destroy the temple in Jerusalem because of their rejection of him. And he did say, destroy this temple and I will raise it up in three days. So he didn't say he would destroy his temple. He said, you're going to destroy it and I will raise it in three days. And he did warn the temple would be destroyed. So he'd come in judgment against the temple, but he didn't say that temple he'd raise in three days. So they conflated two different sayings of Jesus together, garble it up, and then attribute it to Jesus. Yep, exactly. So it's not that Jesus didn't say those things. He said those things, but he didn't say it in the way they reported it, in the way they framed it, right? So they took two separate sayings of Jesus, two separate sayings of Jesus, and combined them together, whether intentionally or unintentionally, because, again, a false witness is not someone who necessarily lies. A false witness is someone who can take your words out of context or interpret your words in the worst possible light. And as it goes with the nature of witnessing, there are times in which I may hear someone say something one time and hear him say something another time and think he's referring to the same thing and then can confuse and combine both statements together as if he's referring to the same thing. You understand why I am so, quote unquote, I don't want to use that word, so adamant about paying attention? So adamant that you don't get distracted by the devil, that you rebuke the devil in the name of Jesus and beg Jesus to perfect our ability to recall these facts, understand them, and my ability to recall the scriptures for the glory of Christ. Because you see, when you're talking about permanent residency, you're going to miss this. Right? 
So what they did was they took two sayings of Jesus, collapsed them together as if he was referring to the same thing. Let's look at it again. Mark 14, 58. So Charbel, keep talking, talking to people about permanent residency. Distract them so they can block and you stay. Okay, one more time. We heard him say, I will destroy this temple, meaning the temple in Jerusalem, that is made with hands. And within three days, I will build another man made without hands. No, that's not what he said. He's referring to two separate things. This temple in Jerusalem, I will come to destroy it. I will come in judgment against it because you've rejected me. But the temple that he said he'd raise up in three days isn't the temple in Jerusalem that he would destroy, but his body that they would destroy that he would raise in three days. So what we have in the Synoptic Gospels is implicit affirmation that Jesus did go around saying, destroy this temple, meaning my body, I'll raise it up in three days. And he did go around saying, that temple in Jerusalem will be destroyed and I will come in judgment to destroy it because you rejected me. Acts 6, 14. Acts 6, 14. Because notice... What Stephen is accused of saying. Acts 6, 14. For we have heard him, meaning Stephen, filled with the Holy Spirit, that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall, shall change the customs of which Moses delivered us. Yep. See, notice you got now independent attestation. Notice Mark, Luke, and John, three independent witnesses attesting that Jesus said what was attributed to him, but not in the way that it was attributed. Are you with me there? Mark, Luke, and John, three independent witnesses, are affirming Jesus did say these things, but not in the manner in which they attributed it to him. He did say he's going to come to destroy the temple in Jerusalem. He did say, destroy the temple, I'll raise it up in, in three days. But he wasn't talking about the same temple. Either they confused the sayings as referring to the same temple, or they decided to take these sayings and combine them together in order to make Jesus look as the most wicked blasphemer imaginable because the Jews thought it blasphemy for someone to say, I will destroy the temple of God and replace it with something better. Did everyone get that? Or did I confuse you guys with this? Everyone got it? Before I move on, you see why you got to focus and not be distracted. Now, what does that mean, though? It means that the historical Jesus did say Destroy this temple, I'll raise it up in three days. And the Jews remembered that he said something like that. But here's what's beautiful. If you want further proof that these books are miraculously produced, inspired by the Holy Spirit, so different writers writing at different times help clarify and fill out the details from another book, another writer that they may not have access to. How these different books are all pieces of the puzzle that you need to bring together to see the masterpiece because these are puzzles produced by the Holy Spirit. Notice that in Mark 14, 58, you have a saying that Jesus would raise up his body, which is the temple. But you don't find anywhere in Mark or Matthew, because Matthew mentions the same saying, where Jesus says something like that. We find it in John. So John fills out the detail. Oh, no wonder at the trial, they remember Jesus saying something about raising the temple in three days because John tells, tells us at the start of his ministry, and I'm sure he repeated it more than once, that Jesus said, destroy the temple, I'll raise it up in three days. But without John, we would not know whether Jesus said something like that at all. You got it now? 
And then in Acts 6.14, the Jews say that Stephen goes around saying, Jesus will soon come to destroy this temple and change the customs of Moses. Why? Because when you destroy the temple, you make much of the Mosaic law obsolete. Do you know that? When you destroy the temple of Jerusalem, there goes the sacrifices and the priesthood because the priests can only offer sacrifices in the temple. So when you destroy the temple, you make much of the law of Moses obsolete. And where do we find Jesus talking about coming in judgment to destroy Jerusalem and the temple? Luke 19, 41 to 44. Luke 21, Mark 13, Mark, Matthew 24. Here, let me show you. Also, Matthew 23, 37, 39. What did Jesus say? Because you rejected me, what's going to happen to your house? Matthew 23, 37, 39. Matthew 23, 37, 39. What's that got to do with Jesus saying, destroy the second temple? What's the Old Testament thought about the first temple being destroyed have to do with Jesus destroying the second temple? Matthew 23, 37, 39, guys, read. Oh, this is Jesus. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee. How often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen, gather her chick, chickens under her wings, and ye would not. You are not willing. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate because you didn't recognize me and are unwilling for me to gather your children to save them. Now your house will be desolate. For I say unto you, ye shall not see me henceforth till ye, sh till ye shall say, shall ye say, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. And then you go into Matthew 24. And it's all about the temple in Jerusalem being destroyed because they rejected Jesus Christ. And this is God's judgment that will fall on them. Right? Everyone with me there? So how does this respond and refute Shabir Ali's objection? Number one, it destroys Shabir's desperate attempt to try to prove that Jesus can't be God because if he died, then he ceased to exist. And how can God cease to exist? Number one, who told you God ceased to exist? Who told you that Jesus, when he died physically, he ceased to exist? He was still alive and conscious and alert, sustaining creation and preserving his body, raising it back to life. Number two, it's not simply a saying found in John. Because Mark and Matthew allude to the fact that Jesus did go around saying that because the Jews remembered him saying something similar, even though they distorted it and conflated it with another saying of his. Right? Yep. Matthew 23, 34, LMC, I, Muslims, does prove that Jesus claimed to be God because in Matthew 23, 34, it says he will send prophets. Matthew 23, 34. Right? So that was Shibri Ali's objection. And here our Lord shows that he must be God, because notice what our Lord says in Matthew 23, 34. Wherefore, behold, I send unto you prophets and wise men and scribes. I, Jesus, send to you prophets, wise men and scribes. Some of them ye shall kill and crucify, and some of them shall ye scourge in your synagogues. How can Jesus send prophets when the Old Testament and the Quran both agree, only God sends prophets. Is everyone clear? Now, Riaz, you got all this meat to go back in Shabra Ali's comment section and bury him and expose him and his wicked prophet, that son of the devil, for the glory of Jesus. I pray he debates me because I promise you by the power of the Holy Spirit, my trust in the Holy Spirit, to perfect my ability, recall these passages and never let me lose this gift, but perfect it in me and give me the power to be sold out for Jesus and love with Jesus and obeying Jesus. I will destroy any credibility he has anymore and send him packing with his prophet for the glory of Jesus. I cannot stand that charlatan. He's disgusting. He's wickedly disgusting and repulsive. 
You all right? All right? Everyone with me? So you see how to respond to that, right? Jesus is the God-man who died a human death to pay a human debt, and yet he was still alive and conscious and did not cease to exist. And because he was still alive, he was sustaining creation with the Father and the Spirit and preserving his body. And with the Father and Spirit, raised his body immortal, indestructible, and deathless. That's the teaching of the Bible. So now, Christians, where's the problem? Where is the objection? What's the problem with the God-man dying? When neither the Quran nor the Bible defines death as ceasing to exist. How can you respect someone, LMCI, who for over 30 years has been asking the same questions, making the same attacks, insulting and blaspheming God, perverting scripture over and over again, over 30 years of being corrected and doesn't accept correction. Shame on you Christians for respecting him. You're not doing God a favor. You're allowing him to insult God, blaspheme God, insult the majesty of the Lord Jesus. Same questions for over 30 years. Same questions and you still respect the man? Still? Yes. He's been doing it since the late 80s, early 90s. Over 30 years, the same objections, same attack, same Bible perversion, right? Same blasphemies, same insults. And you guys say, oh, he's such a great guy. He's such a respectful Muslim. He's such a nice fellow. Satan appears as an angel of light. Even Satan appears beautiful. And it says even his ministers appear as ministers of righteousness. Why would you fall prey and be duped by someone who comes very charming, very humble, very articulate, when that is the biggest deception and scam of the devil to present one of his filthy, wicked, blasphemous dogs in sheep's clothing and give the appearance of being pious and humble. Why do you fall for the schemes of the devil? 2 Corinthians 11, 13 to 15. Let's read it. 2 Corinthians 11, verses 13 to 15. Show no respect to these filthy, ravenous, blasphemous dogs. Don't let American churchianity influence your approach. Stop. American churchianity is going to hell. The true church of Jesus Christ is indestructible. The true body of believers are indestructible, preserved by the Almighty God. But American churchianity is going down the toilet, going to hell. Look at it. Western churchianity. Look what's become. 2 Corinthians 11, 13 and 15. Look at it. Open your eyes. You call these churches? Do you call these churches? Pastors, priests, bishops, pedophiles, sexual perverts, predators, capitulating with homosexuality, will LGBTQ, transgenderism, Socialist Marxist agenda. That's the church. Come on, guys. Who cares what they think about your approach? You're not being Christ like. Gee, your opinion matters. Go to hell. Get out of my face. Stop, guys. Enough. Enough of trying to live up to their expectation and appease them. As long as you ask the Holy Spirit, say, Holy Spirit, I love you. I want to be in love, with, in love with you, and I want to cling to you. Possess me fully and completely possess me by your almighty power. Save me from my own sinfulness and from Satan in the world. And do not let me sin in my anger. Let me be angry, but not sin in my anger for the glory of Jesus. 2 Corinthians 11, 13 and 15. 
Folks, I'll be back on later and do another live stream. I promise you, Lord willing. It's going to be late, but it's okay. It's Sunday. COVID, we're stuck at home. Who cares? 2 Corinthians 11, 13, and 15. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 13 and 15. Read this with me. For such are false apostles. Guys, focus for the glory of Jesus. Focus. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ, pretending to be apostles of Christ. Now watch. No, and do not marvel. No wonder. For Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Now watch 15. 15, guys. Therefore, it is no great thing. It should be no surprise. It shouldn't surprise you. If his ministers, his tools, his sons like Shabir, that wicked vile dog, also be transformed as ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. Did you catch it? Nikita. There's a context for everything. There's a context for everything, Nikita. Yes, 2 Timothy 2, 24 to 26 says, right, that when the man of God answers, he should do so with gentleness, right? Without argument, without anger, if the person that you're witnessing to can be saved and plucked out of the snares of the devil. But can I show you, Nikita, what the same Paul says? See? And the servant Lord must not strive, but be gentle, men apt to teach patient, in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. If God peradventure perhaps will give them repentance to acknowledging of the truth. Now, Nikita, that is true. When someone comes and watch my YouTube sessions and is from a different religion or no religion and ask questions, ask questions that one answers, I gently answer them. But the same Paul then shows you what your attitude should be once someone has shown himself to be a pervert who doesn't want to hear the truth but wants to pervert the truth, wants to distort the truth, wants to attack the Bible, blaspheme God, and deceive people from the true path. How do you treat such a one? Are you ready, Nikita? Are you ready for that? Are you ready? Can I show you the verses from Paul? From Paul. Okay, 2 Timothy chapter 2 from Paul, 16 to 18. Pay attention, Nikita. This is the same Paul who wrote 2 Timothy 2, right? You just quoted 2 Timothy 2. Just go a few verses earlier. 2 Timothy 2, 16 to 18. Read. But shun profane and fab vain babblings, like talking about permanent residency. Just kidding. For they will increase unto more ungodliness. Now watch this. And their word will eat as doth a canker, like gangrene, of whom is Hemanias and Philetus. He even mentions two of them. Who spread false teaching like gangrene. What does he say about them? Who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already, and overthrow the faith of some. Paul just mentioned two people to shun and avoid. Do you think Paul wants you to be gentle with them? They're spreading cancerous doctrine. They're spreading false teaching that's spreading like spiritual cancer and gangrene with their lies about the resurrection. Now, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 14 to 16, 14, I'm sorry, 2 Timothy chapter 4. Four, not two. Why am I saying two? Second Timothy chapter four, verses 14 to 15. Second Timothy chapter four, verses 14 to 15. Read this. Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works, of whom thou be thou aware also. Be aware of him. For he hath greatly withstood our words. Now, Nikita, reconcile what Paul said in 2 Timothy 2, 24 to 26 with what he said in 2 Timothy 2, 16, 18, and what he said right here in 2 Timothy 2, 4, 14 to 15 because he's praying God's curse on him. He's praying God's judgment on him. Read, Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. The Lord reward him. You think he's blessing him? God repay him for what he's done according to his works. Well, hold on, Paul. His works are evil. 
He's harmed you. And you're asking the Lord to repay him for his works, which are evil. So you're asking the Lord to then damn him and condemn him to hell. Yes, that's what I'm asking. And then he's warning Christians, beware of him. He has greatly withstood our words. Did you see that, Nikita? Did you see that? Exactly, Ariel Gonzalez. Convince me, guys, please. Argue with me and say, no, in 2 Timothy 4.14... Paul is not praying judgment and wrath and condemnation. Then how do you explain Paul saying, Alexander, right, has done much evil to me. God repay him for what he's done. Does that sound like a blessing? Oh, God, repay him with salvation. What does that sound like? 1 Timothy 1, 18 to 20. 1 Timothy 1, 18 to 20. Exactly, da, da Drew Paget. First Timothy 1, 18 to 20. Now watch this, Nikita. Read Paul. I'm reading Paul in context, not taking him out of context. First Timothy 1, 18 to 20. Guys, read this. This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou... By them might have swore a good warfare that you notice war. You're in war, Nikita. Everyone, make a good warfare. You're in war, Timothy. It's spiritual battle. Declare war on the kingdom of darkness. But watch here holding faith and a good conscience, which some having put away, they put away the true faith and their conscience now corrupted by evil, put away concerning faith, have made shipwreck. Of whom is Hemenaeus and Alexander? The same two individuals he mentioned in 2 Timothy. Whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. <whistles> Thank you, LMC Muslim. God bless you. Did you catch it? What did I do to Hemenaeus and Alexander? Hand them over to Satan so Satan can destroy them. Because they're wicked blasphemers. How many people quote those passages of Paul? They're always, they always quote the passages, let your speech always be seasoned with grace, brother. The man of God should be gentle and meek when he teaches, brother. Why don't they quote these passages? How many of them quote the passages I quoted to you? How many? Can you name them? How many? Acts 13, 6 to 12. Let's see how Paul treated sons of the devil. Let's see how Paul treated demons, agents of the devil like Shabir. You tell me that Paul standing before Shabir is going to have respect for him? Acts 13, 6 to 12, folks. Acts 13, 6 to 12. Please read with me. Please read with me. And when they had gone through the aisle unto Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew, whose name was Bar-Jesus, which was with the deputy of the country, Sergius Paulus, a prudent man, who called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of God. So this man wanted to hear the word of God. Now watch Nikita and everyone else, what the sorcerers did. <clears throat> okay, But Elimas, the sorcerer, for so is his name by interpretation, withstood them, opposed them, like Shabir does, attacking the truth, mocking the truth, perverting the truth, insulting Jesus, his wicked dog, who's no better than his dog, Prophet Muhammad, seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. Keep him away from being a believer. Now watch this. He's filled with the Holy Spirit, folks. Filled with the Holy Spirit. Then Saul was also called Paul. Filled with the Holy Ghost. So this is from the Holy Spirit, this anger and zeal and rebuke. Set his eyes on him and said, O oh, full of all subtly deceit and mischief, thou child of the devil, you son of Satan, thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? Now watch 11 and 12. And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee. And thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. And immediately there fell on him a mist 
and darkness, and he went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. Then the deputy, when they saw what was done, believed, being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. How many people have quoted this example of Paul for you? And why don't they? Why don't they? Just in case you missed it, Acts 13, verses 9 to 10. Did Paul say this in his sinful flesh? He wasn't being Christ-like? Filled with the Holy Ghost. Filled with the Holy Spirit. One more time, Acts 13, 9 to 10. That's why I don't care anymore. They don't want to support me? Good riddance. I don't need your money, and I'm not doing it for money. May God save me never to whore myself for money or fame, but be holy and pure in love with Jesus. Please, I beg you for that, for all of us, Lord Jesus. Here again, Acts 13, 9 to 10. Acts 13, 9 to 10. Then Saul, who is also called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him and said, O oh, full of subtlety, deceit, and all mischief, causing mischief, you child of the devil, you son of the devil, you son of Satan, the enemy of all righteousness, will, now, will you not stop to pervert the right ways of the Lord? Shabir Ali, perverting the word of God to deceive Muslims to hell, you wicked, filthy dog. And you guys get angry at me? And you guys get angry at me? You understand why? No more. Folks, let me just tell you, time is short. Road MF, FM, God gave you a standard to judge. Did you know, Road, in John 7, 24, you know what Jesus said? Make a righteous judgment, Road, John 7, 24. God doesn't condemn you when you make righteous judgment based on Scripture. He condemns you for being a wicked hypocrite, condemning people for the very things that you also are guilty of. No, Derek, it wasn't. 200 years ago, the church in America was on fire for the Lord. On fire. But they let, let Derek a little leaven to creep in. 1 Corinthians 5, 7. Let me show you. 1 Corinthians 5, 7. Here's how a church becomes corrupt and satanic and used of the devil. 1 Corinthians 5, 7. Here, Paul tells you. Derek, be amazed that the Bible has all the answers. The Bible supernatural has all the answers. Purge out, therefore, the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Now notice what he says there. There is going to be leaven creeping in. Purge it. Get rid of it. Do not let it spread. And what is the leaven he's talking about? 1 Corinthians 5, verse 8. 1 Corinthians 5, verse 8. You guys got me on fire today, man. 1 Corinthians 5, verse 8. I wasn't expecting to be this angry. Righteously, hopefully, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, let us keep the feast not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Now, Derek, you know what leaven is? Wickedness and malice that you don't check and get rid of from your congregation. Now, what's the context of 1 Corinthians 5? 1 Corinthians 5. A man is having sex with his stepmother. That's the context. And Paul is saying, aren't you ashamed? 1 Corinthians 5. If you read verses 1 to 5 and 9 to 13, it's there. I'm not making it up. The entire chapter. He's like, wait, wait, wait. There's someone claiming to be a Christian who's sleeping with a stepmother, having sex, sex with a stepmother, and you allow him in the congregation? and welcome him, and worship with him, and sing praises with him, and let, let him take the Eucharist, the bread in the cup, the body in the, the blood of Christ? You serious? Purge that leaven. Get him out of there. Throw him out. What is he doing in your midst? So, Derek, to answer your question, this is how it starts. The church starts capitulating, Starts compromising and allowing a little evil and justifying it. And then they allow that. Then they allow the next thing and the next thing 
And the next thing, bam, and now that church is a tool of the devil. It's no longer the church. And folks, can I share something with you historically? Uh, and this is not, I'm not making it up. I am not making it up. Historically, and I don't know why the connection, maybe I do, and maybe I'll talk about it as I further reflect on it. Good, Brenda, praise the Lord. Confirmation from the Lord. Confirmation from the Holy Spirit, amen? You, guys, you may think I'm, I'm lying when I say this. Go back and look at the, the early 20th century. When the Protestant churches started compromising, did you know up until the 1930s, from what I've been told, and the people who said it are men of integrity, I don't think they'd be lying to me, that the Protestants also are against artificial birth control, contraception, and then they laxed on that. Okay. But then later on, guess what happened? And I don't know. I think I do know the tie. I'm going to reflect on and talk about it. Okay. The first step of compromise among the Protestants that started this downward spiral. You may get upset at me, but I'm being honest. When Protestant churches started ordaining women clergy, that became the first step that led to now ordaining homosexual clergy. It went hand in hand. Do you know that? Not making it up. Go look at it. Go look at all the churches that now ordain homosexual clergy. Go back in time. What started that downward spiral was they allowed the ordination of women clergy, meaning women bishops. And then shortly after that, they allowed homosexual clergy. There's a connection with one and the other. Do you know that? Oh, yeah. T check it out. Do your research. Do you know that? It didn't start with the ordination of homosexual clergy. It started with the ordination of women clergy, women priests. And bishops, and that became the downward spiral, the leaven that went unchecked, and it spread and spread. And the next thing is, okay, well, if women can be clergy, why not homosexuals? Especially homosexuals are in committed, godly relationship. It went hand in hand. I'm not exaggerating. I am not exact. I'm not lying. Prove me wrong. <laughs> Prove me wrong. Go search. See, folks, let me be honest with you. I laugh at Western churchanity. I laugh at American churchanity. I laugh at European churchanity. They're disgusting. They're a joke. I don't care what they think of me, and I don't want their approval. Neither should you. Neither should you. And by the way, I'm not the only one that's quote-unquote militant. Glory to the triune God, glory to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the true God who's almighty and will preserve his church and separate his church from this fake institution, the satanic organism pretending to be the church. You have militant warriors in all the major branches of Trinitarian churches. I mentioned two earlier. I'm going to mention them again. You think I'm militant. I wish I could meet Michael Voris and kiss him on the head. The name of his organization, YouTube channel, is Church Militant. A diehard Roman Catholic on fire, sold out for the glory of the Trinity and what the Holy Bible actually teaches on these issues. And he is the first to expose the corrupt, wicked, effeminate, homosexual, pedophiliac priests and cardinals and bishops along with Taylor Marshall, Michael Voris. So God is raising them up. We're all, all scattered and calling out the filth for what it is. Michael Voris, that's his name, and Taylor Marshall. So, what does Galatians 3.28 got to do with women bishops? It has nothing to do with it. If I apply your logic, since there are men and women, there's no man or woman, no male or female. That means now men can get pregnant and give birth because there's no longer male nor female, right? 
in Christ. That's not what Paul means. You're distorting Galatians 3.28, taking it out of context. Galatians 3.28 means that as far as salvation is concerned, as far as, read it, it's about salvation. Galatians 3, 26, 29. Read it, Galatians 3, 28. The context is that as far as salvation is concerned, as far as Jesus is concerned, he doesn't love men more than women, love Jews more than Greeks, love uh, slaves less than free men. All of you he loves equally with an infinite love and grants to you the same salvation and glorification and immortality. That's what it says has nothing to do with the distinction in gender and roles. If I take you the way you're interpreting that passage, there's neither male nor female. So, hey, I'm not a male. I'm not a female. I'm transgender. You just made a case for transgenderism or agenderism. And that means I can get pregnant and give birth too. Come on, man. Don't pervert the scriptures this way. Please don't. Now, let me wrap it up with some more passages. And God willing, I'll be back on a little later. I'll be back on because, Lord willing, I expect the Muslim to call me. We'll address it. Cherokee, you, it, Cherokee, I don't know if you think that you're making your case. I don't think you understand anything I said. So what you're doing is you're embarrassing yourself here. Okay. Cherokee, let's now walk you through this. Your egalitarianism. Even when God created male and female in the beginning, who did he create first, the male or the female? And when he created the female... Who named her as a sign of his authority? And she was created for what purpose? To come alongside and assist the male in his God-given God -given duty and responsibility. So I don't think you want to go to Genesis 1 because it's going to embarrass you, Cherokee. And this is what happens again when you're one verse Charlie that quotes passages out of context. Who came first, the male or the female? Who was created for who and who named who? So please, Cherokee, stop while you're ahead because you're going to embarrass yourself. Trust me, sister. Been there, done that, got the T-shirt. Don't embarrass yourself. Just learn and listen, and don't be so stubborn. Okay? Yep. So this is, again, these guys that pontificate, they think I haven't heard these arguments. This is what's killing me. They think I was just born yesterday. And I didn't know about Genesis 1. Wow, wait, 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 wait. Genesis 1? There's a Genesis 1 where male and female are said to be the image of God and given dominion over his physical creation? My goodness, I didn't know Genesis 1 existed. I got to go change my theology. Why didn't you tell me about Genesis 1, darn you? Are you serious? Come on. But thank you, Cherokee. I had no clue Genesis 1 was in the Bible. I had no clue Genesis 2 was in the Bible. I had no clue that Genesis 3 is in the Bible. And I had no clue that even though Paul could have mentioned female bishops, he never mentions a female bishop, but the only bishops that he mentions are males, husbands of one wife. But wait, Paul, don't you know Genesis 1, Paul? Paul! Genesis 1, Paul! Darn you, Paul! Why can't a bishop be a woman? See? Yeah, I've never heard these arguments. Never. No. No, me. I've never heard those arguments. No, bullies, bullies, bullies. Bullies. Cherokee, do you want me to really embarrass you that it is in the Greek? Do you want me to embarrass you that it is in the Greek, 1 Timothy 3? Can you tell me what the Greek word is? And Cherokee, I'm going to send you back to, you, to your husband, the deacon, because I think in the marriage, you're the bishop, he's the deacon. So I'm going to send you to your husband, the deacon, as you rule over him. And I bet you, you have marital problems, I guarantee you. This attitude, I think you're the man in the relationship. Guaranteed, you have marital problems, and I wouldn't be shocked you're not even married. Because you want to become the man at all costs. Okay? okay. Let's see. Oh, boy. Okay. Now, I just busted you because you're a liar. Gonaikos. Cherokee, gonaikos is the word for a woman, for a wife. Guys, can you click on it and expose this liar and get her out of here? I guarantee you she has problems in her marriage if she is married. And she has, I'm, not, I'm being honest, 
When a woman tries too hard to become a man and dominate, she's got serious issues. Now, she just said it's not in the Greek, right? Can you guys go to 1 Timothy 3, 2? Can you guys confirm for me that the Greek word, gonaikos, that's the woman. That's where you get, by the way, the word uh, gynecology. Gynecology. Gyne, gone. Why did you just lie to us and say it's not in the Greek? Why did you just lie to us and say it's not in the Greek? Get her out of here. Get her out of here. God have mercy on your husband. Sure. Yeah, it's not in the Greek. Anyway, yeah, it's a Jezebel spirit. Folks, let me tell you something. One of Satan's strategies. Of course, you have Bobby all throughout Book of Acts. Men and women are preaching. Even in the congregation, you have women prophesying, preaching. Right? I'm not saying women do not play any role. Women do not have the role of leader of the church, a bishop of the church. Even the Catholics and the Orthodox would admit you had an office for female deacons because you needed female deacons to assist females. Right? We're not talking about that. But anyway, we're not talking about that. Focus on what I'm about. Bishop, priest, bishop, priest. That's only a male assigned position. Okay? Yeah. Anyway, let me wrap it up with some more points. I'll come back a little later. I hope this was education because we talked about a lot of issues. But let me tell you, let me tell you Satan's strategy. Satan knows what God has ordained for healthy societies, healthy families, and healthy church. Whether you like it or not, Christians. The structure in the family is patriarchal, male leadership. The structure in the church is male leadership. The males are the bishops, the priests, right? They can rele re re uh, re uh, relegate, relegate, delegate, regulate women in assuming roles in the church under the authority and headship of the bishops, the priests who are males. Okay. Satan knows this is God's structure for healthy church, healthy society, healthy families. So guess what he's going to do? Do everything he can to destroy that structure, to then usurp the role of the male, assign it to the female, to masculinize the woman, feminize the man, to produce a feminine emasculized, sissified men and women who now become men, destroying the family, society, and the church, producing dysfunctional children who grow up to become misfits like them. And you see it all around you. See it all around you. Again, prove me wrong. Go back in the early 20th century of America where these God-ordained roles were honored and then point to me the problems they face in comparison to what we face now. Guys, in schools, they got metal detectors and policemen. Whereas in the early 20th century, when you had boys and girls segregated, did you have those problems? Did you have those problems? When you had boys going to boys' school and girls going to girls' schools, did you get boys and girls knocking each other up? Pregnancy? Girls in grammar school and high school getting pregnant and then murdering the child, abortion, calling it pro-choice? Did you have metal detectors? Did you have policemen? When they had prayer in school, honoring God in school, did you have these social ills? Have you really advanced? Yeah, we've advanced towards Satanism, evil and destruction, but we haven't advanced for the better. Guys, these are facts. Prove me wrong. These are facts. It started in the 60s and went downhill ever since. Can, you, can any of you say you're wrong, Sam? You're wrong, Sam. Am I? Am I wrong? In grammar school, girls are getting knocked up, eighth grade. In high school, they're getting knocked up. Metal detectors, policemen. Who would have imagined that in the 20s, in the 30s, in the 40s, in the 50s, in the 60s? 
You see what God is showing you? You know what God is showing you? Here's what you have sowed. You, I'm sorry, here's what you've reaped. You reap what you sow, and here's the result of doing things contrary to my will. You want to do it your way? You want to do your will? Do things according to your way, according to your wisdom? And you want to get me out of schools and forsake the design for family and church that I have created from the beginning? Here is the fruit. Here is, the, here is what you have reaped from all that you have sown. Okay? So we're advancing, all right. We're advancing in evil, in destruction, in Satanism, and anarchy, and chaos, and godlessness to the point, to the point that they want to defund policemen as if the society is fit not to be policed, as if we can actually survive in the streets without policemen. Every man taking the law in his own hand or her hand. Are you serious? Are you serious? So let's wrap it up. And Lord willing, I'll be back on a little later. Do me a favor, Protestant, for the sake of clarity. So people, I love the King James. You guys know my position on it. But I want people to understand the language. So Ephesians 4, 26 to 27. Ephesians 4, 26 to 27. Dude, Derek, we had policemen when I was going to high school, Derek Wildman. I had policemen at the high school I went to. How many of you guys know Mather? Mather, down about the 80s, 90s, even though I didn't go to that high school slide. I'm now. Ephesians 4, 26, 27. Folks, this is for you. Do not let anyone lie to you and tell you it is never right to be angry. No, don't let them lie to you and tell you it's never right to be angry. Ephesians 4, 26 to 27. Be you angry, even though I just told this guy, New King James. Hey, Joe Biden. Joe Biden, get out of here, Joe. We want Protestant believer, Joe Biden. Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. Ephesians 4, 26 to 27. Joe Biden, get lost, buddy. The King James translates it perfectly, but I want a little clearer English for people to get. Understand Ephesians 4, 26 to 27. Roy, I just gave you it right here, Ephesians 4, 26, 27. And Roy, what's the condition? Your brother, Roy, Ephesians, Matthew 5, 22. Is Jesus saying, don't be angry? He says, don't be angry with your brother. Who's to say that person you're angry with is your brother? You see now, Roy, read Matthew 5, 22 in context. Ephesians 4, 26, 27. Be angry and do not sin. Wait, I thought it's never right to be angry. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, right? Nor give place to the devil. Did you guys catch it? Be angry, but do not sin. So God is telling you, there is righteous anger, holy indignation. And I gave you examples. Paul calling someone, oh, you son of the devil. You wicked child of the devil. Paul even called those who perverted the gospel dogs. And he's talking about fellow countrymen, Jews. Philippians 3, verse 2. Did you catch it, Marilyn? Ephesians 4, 26, 27. Philippians 3, verse 2. Let me end with a couple of verses. And Lord willing, I'll be back a little later. So just look for the announcement on my Facebook pages on YouTube channel. God willing, I'll be back later. Notice, Philippians 3, verse 2. Beware of dogs. Beware of evildoers. Beware of the mutilation. He's talking to the Jews. You Gentiles, beware of those dogs. These filthy Jews who are telling you you need to get circumcised, mutilate your flesh to be saved. They're dogs. They're filthy. Avoid them. Wow, Paul. I don't see Jesus in you. You're seeing it now, Akasha, in the examples I'm giving you. Being angry over perverts who pervert God's word slander Jesus, who justify molesting children, pedophilia, <clears throat> homosexuality, transgenderism, abortion, which is murder, that's when you have the right to be angry and condemn it. Right? 
Let's end it with Titus 1, 5 to 14. Now, we're going to break it into three sections. Now, guys, final passage. Let's break it down into three sections. It's going to be Titus 1. I said 5 to 14. We're going to read to 16. But hold on. Do me a favor, <clears throat> Protestant. Post Titus 1, verses 5 to 7. Let's start with Titus 1, verses 5 to 7. Guys, don't let the Muslim distract you. Focus. For this reason, I left you in Crete. Guys, read what Paul says to Titus. For this reason, I left you in Crete, that you should set in order the things that are lacking and appoint elders in every city as I commanded you. If a man is blameless, the husband of one wife. See, it doesn't mean wife, Sam. Gunaikos. Gune. Doesn't mean wife. Gynecology. Doesn't mean a woman doctor to check her private part. Good night. No, it doesn't mean that, Sam. Shut up, you heretic, Sam. Shut up. All right. If a man is blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of dissipation or insubordination. For a bishop must be blameless as a steward of God, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not given to wine, not violent, no, not greedy for money. Now notice, a steward of God. What does a steward of God mean? A steward means you don't own the building. Folks, let me tell you what bishops, priests are. They are managers of someone else's property. A steward doesn't own the building. A steward is a manager called to make sure the building is running <clears throat> properly. The building is intact. In other words, a priest, a bishop is the manager of someone else's house. Whose house? God's house. So the manager can't do what he wants in the house. He can only run the house, manage the house, according to the owner. What do you think God is going to do to all these stewards and managers who have run amongst the church, who have allowed transgenderism, who allowed LGBTQ, who allow premarital sex, who allow <clears throat> abortion and justify it. What do you think the owner of the house is going to do to these managers, these stewards? Damn them twice as much as those who don't know any better. Okay, now let's read Titus 1. We're going to read 8. To nine, Titus one eight to nine. Titus one eight to nine. But hospital, so the bishop is hospital. A lover, what is good? You love what is good. Sober minded, thinking God's thoughts after uh, after him. Letting the Bible inform the way you think and what your attitude and disposition should be. Be just, holy, self control. Now watch verse nine, guys. Verse 9 is the key. Holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and convict those who contradict. Titus 1 verse 9. Guys, let's park on it. No, we don't hate. Guys, we don't hate homosexuals and lesbians, transgenders. We pray to show them the love of God. We pray that they'll experience the love of God. We pray that the Holy Spirit will convict them to repent and turn to God, their only source of meaning and love, who defines what their gender is, not them. We love them into the kingdom, but when we find the militant homosexuals, the militant LGBTQ, the militant transgenders who hate God and his word, that's a different story. We don't all lump them together in the same boat, right? Titus 1.9, one more time. Titus 1.9, one more time. Titus 1.9, one, one more time. I don't say much about them, Steve, Joseph. I don't care about them. Guys, pay attention, please. Rebuke Satan in the name of Jesus Christ and focus. Look what Paul says. A bishop must know the word and be able to teach it. Holding fast the faithful word as he's been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine, 
exhort and convict those who contradict. Did you catch it? How many bishops are disqualified just by Titus 1 verse 9? Titus 1 9 says a bishop must know the faith, must live out the faith, must understand the faith to teach it and refute those who contradict it. How many bishops are now disqualified from being a bishop? According to Titus 1 verse 9. How are you going to refute and contradict someone who's opposing sound doctrine? How are you going to be able to teach sound doctrine when you do not know it? Now, Titus 1 verses 10 to 14. Titus 1 verses 10 to 14. And we're almost done. Titus 1, verses 10 to 14. For there are many insubordinate, meaning unruly, who will not be subject to the word of God and God's authority. Many who will not submit to God's word and his authority. Both idle talkers, people who are lazy and go around and gossip, deceivers, especially those of the circumcision, meaning ethnic Jews, especially ethnic Jews. Those mouths must be stopped. Wow, that sounds like very angry language, militant language. Paul, I don't see, see any love in you. Those mouths must be shut. You got to shut their mouths who subvert whole households, teaching things which they ought not for the sake of dishonest gain. You got to shut their mouths. Shut them up. One of them, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. Now notice verse 13. This testimony is true. Therefore, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. Let's post verse 13 one more time. Verse 13 one more time. <clears throat> this testimony is true. Therefore, rebuke them sharply. Rebuke them sternly. Rebuke them harshly. But Paul, I thought you need to be gentle and meek and not... Quick-tempered, Paul, that they may be sound in the faith. Now, verses 14 to 16. 14 to 16, we're done. Verses 14 to 16. Not giving heed to Jewish fables. Forget these nonsense, these myths and fairy tales. And do not give in to commandments of men who turn from the truth. Shun them, avoid them, expose them, refute them. Now here is where we're going to end it. To the pure, all things are pure. But to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. When your mind is corrupt and tainted and your heart is corrupt and tainted, you take the, that which is pure and you corrupt and taint it and see it in, in corrupt, evil, impure light. Now watch here. Let's finish it. But, all right? To the pure, all things are pure. But to those who are defiled and unbelieving, corrupt and unbelieving, nothing is pure. Even their mind and conscience are defiled. Now watch 16 and we end it. They profess to know God. They profess to know God. But in works they deny him. All these pedophile priests and pastors, all these sexual predators who claim to be Christian, who support LGBTQ or abortion, right? All of them profess to know God, claim to be men of God, women of God, men and women of faith. But in their works, their deeds, they deny him. Being abominable, disobedient, and disqualified for every good work. Guys, can you be honest with me? Can you be honest with me? Does this sound like Paul was like these Western pastors, these sissified emasculated, feminized pastors, honestly, the way he speaks. Can I challenge you to do something this weekend? Can I challenge you to do something? Well, the weekend's over, but for the upcoming week. Can you do me a favor? Read the book of Acts. Have a notebook pad, and I want you to write down all the times when Paul preached, and the riots he started, the fights he started, the chaos that broke out every time he preached. Count how many times Paul started riots, started fights, started division, 
got people angry to the point they threw him in jail and wanted to kill him and even stone him. Count, do you think Paul got that reaction by preaching the way some of these wishy-washy, effeminate, sissified pastors do? Do you think he went around saying, Jesus loves you. It's okay. Jesus loves you. Do you think really? But I don't want you to take my word for it. I want you to go read it and count. Wow. He started to write here. Wow. He got thrown in jail here. Wow. They stoned him over here. Wow. They went live it over here. Wow. They, he caused a division here. Count. Count. May we all, by the power of the Holy Spirit, become like Paul in his worship and love and devotion to Jesus, in his zeal and fearless courage in proclaiming Jesus Christ without shame. I pray that we have modern-day Pauls and Paulas, female Pauls, for the glory of Jesus. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Jesus Christ is Jehovah God Almighty, to the glory of the Father. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Sooner than later, keep us in love with you. We love you, Father. Son of God, we love you. Holy Spirit, we love you. Save us from our sinfulness. Destroy our flesh. Fill us with the fruit and life from the Holy Spirit. To be holy and love you and worship you. To know the word. To plumb, to plumb the depths of your word. To live it out by the power of the Holy Spirit. And preach it without shame, without fear, even of prison or death. Please, Holy Spirit. And provide our daily bread. To depend on no one but on you to provide for us. For the glory of Jesus. And keep us in love with the Lord. In Jesus' name. Father, Holy Spirit, bless my children in Jesus' name. Guys, covenant with me. Pray and fast for my daughters and I. Please, don't stop. Pray and fast for my daughters and I. That my daughters will be healthier than me. That they'll fall in love with Jesus. That God will save them from harm. That if the Lord tarries and wants me to be around, I'll see them grow up to be godly women. Pray the Lord will bring them to my arms now, not later, in Jesus' name, to save them from this immoral, wicked union between Michelle and Mark. Martin. Please pray against that. It's not a holy union. It's a satanic one that it won't damage them. Pray the Lord Jesus helps me to fall in love with them and be holy and pure, not lip service, to pray more and fast more and study more and the health I need and the provision to serve the Lord. And pray God will perfect my ability. Recall scripture that I don't lose that gift, but perfect it in me and use it perfectly for the glory of Jesus and not for the praise of men. Because I need your prayers. God acts and moves when you pray because he loves your prayers, church, and pray for each other. Lord willing, I may be on a little later, so look for the announcement on my YouTube channel or on Facebook because YouTube has shadow banned me. Shadow banned me, but that's okay. Christ is risen. He's on the throne. And no one can dethrone King Jesus. Love you for the sake of the Lord. Christ is risen, risen indeed. <clears throat>